everybody. How you doing out there? So, we got someone, someone over here is good. The rest of you okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're all right. This is good. So, next up on the Alpha stage, uh, talking about, uh, so we were just uh, talking about there's, there's a bunch of people in software who love JavaScript who probably slightly don't understand some of it. And there's a bunch of people in software who love testing and probably slightly don't understand some of it. And there's not a whole lot of people who overlap the JavaScript world and the unit testing world. But one of those people is our next speaker. Please welcome here to tell us all about writing tests that don't suck. Please welcome David Whitney. Thank you, thank you. Really welcome to the, the Build Stuff SymphWave uh, neon party, it's great. So, actually, before we move on, does anyone know what those things are? These are vacuum cleaners, because they definitely do suck. Uh. So, <laughs> to anyone that hasn't met me, and I appreciate I am somewhat conspicuous, other than on stage with Dylan, I guess. Um, I wrote a few books and, and built some massive web scale systems, but really, I've spent about 20 years playing with all kinds of technology that I can get my hands on, and mostly trying to do TDD in just about all of it. And it gets weird from language to language and framework to framework. And what we're going to do in this talk is we're going to do like a real deep iceberg talk that starts off as a 101. Just hands, who writes tests in JavaScript here? Great. So there'll be a lot of new material in the 101 stuff as well as like the 2001 at the bottom of this iceberg. Um, so here's the thing. I was originally a self-taught developer, and the... Uh, the funny thing is, for the first 10 years of my entire career, I didn't write a single test. That's my horrible confession. I hate the fact that it's always recorded. Not a single test. And everything was just kind of OK. Everything was fine. Everything kind of, kind of worked. You know, in fact, I made it through an entire early 2000s computer science degree <laughs> with nary a mention of unit testing, which is catastrophic and terrible. Um, that we did do entire modules on the software testing lifecycle, which also mostly isn't a thing in people's businesses now. Um, you know, they were all about test plans, and it was all very 1990s. Now, but you know what? I was really, really lucky, because in my very first job out of university, I was happy enough to have a mentor that introduced me to the then very, very nascent concept of testing. And, you know, I'll be honest, I really didn't get it straight away. But working with this mentor put me on this path of discovery that really honestly shaped my entire career. And I always give the, the, the guy who's called Andy Longshore. He was brilliant. He's still working today in the UK. And he really totally changed my career um, when I was barely more than a precocious teenager. So while this talk on the surface is about how to write tests that survive, and especially in JavaScript, um, really, I suppose it's a little bit about my own personal experience with testing and how it changed the path of my career. So it's going to be one of those sessions where we start somewhere really, really obvious and end up somewhere where you probably will not expect. So we're going to start by covering some of the basics. And if you've ever written a test before, this stuff will be obvious. So we'll probably move quite quickly. Um, but I often get asked why I'm so enthusiastic about testing. So for me, honestly, testing is beautiful. Like, testing is the thing that's fundamentally of software. It's our own discipline. It's the thing that isn't borrowed or mimicked. And we always talk about how, you know, we're engineers and this. But testing is fundamentally a software discipline. Software testing is. And it's the only thing that really proves our software actually works. So whenever I'm faced with folks asking me, you know, do they really need to test thing X, Y, or Z or in their software? Or you know, what don't they need to test in, in their applications? I always answer with exactly the same question. Really simple. Don't test the bits that you're OK failing in production. Because I tell you, they definitely will. 100% definitely will. And I'm not going to promise you that writing good tests is, you know, even if you get them right, is going to stop your code failing in production, because that will also definitely happen. But what it will do is it will help, when your code does test in production, find out the thing that did fail, and it will help you find it quickly. So let's talk about some very foundational basics to start out. So first, a definition. Thanks, Wikipedia. In computer programming, unit testing is a software testing method where individual units of source code sets one or more computer program modules together with associated control data, usage procedures, and operating procedures. And they are tested to determine whether they are fit to use. Now, nobody talks like that in the real world. I don't think I've ever seen the word like usage procedures and operating procedures in my 20 years as a programmer. But we're going to start by talking about the humble garden variety unit test, what it is, but most importantly, what it isn't. 
So unit tests test a piece of code, and unit means the unit of isolation, the thing that's being tested. Now they test functions. Sometimes units refer to single classes in object-oriented programming, um, and unit tests are, are written using a test framework. Now, your test code is then subsequently executed using a test runner, and that's the thing that executes and discovers your tests. And unit tests are made up of one or more assertions, normally, lines of code that verify your outputs. Now, this is very much the stuff that anyone's ever written a test will know, but maybe didn't have names for. Now, you know, as with most things in the JavaScript ecosystem specifically, the framework wars were bloody and long. Um, so when we start talking about something, people often say, oh, well, you know, what tools are we going to use? What frameworks are we going to use? Um, honestly, the examples in this um, session are just going to be using Jest. So Jest is a combined test runner, test framework, and assertion tool. So all three of those things in one. Now, Jest isn't the only tool, tool available to write tests in JavaScript. And, you know, arguably, the standard was set by things like Jasmine and Mocha in the early 2010s. Um, and there are a bunch of other libraries that enable different styles of testing, popular things like Storybook in the UI and component space, and then newer tools like Vitest, which are basically Jest compatible test runners. Now, like most things in software, brand recognition and support basically wins everything. So people use Jest because Facebook wrote it. That's, that's honestly the answer. But the, the thing about having a dominant tool in the ecosystem like that is everything else in the ecosystem will generally support it as well. Um, so it's the one you'll probably use. So I want us to describe X-unit frameworks in general. Now, X-unit frameworks is the name for the loose family of frameworks that implement roughly the same pattern of test fixtures and test cases, regardless of the language you're using. And now, there's a good chance that the dominant framework in every language is X-unit styled. So it's, you know, be it Jest in JavaScript, N-unit, and now X-unit in C-sharp, J-unit in Java, they're all X-unit frameworks that do the same kind of pattern tests. Interestingly, the very first um, unit test framework, the first X unit framework was Smalltalk. It was S, S unit in Smalltalk. Now, when we talk about assertions, and that's a massive ass list of, of functions. Now, assertions are used to, to verify your, your functions and your code. Now, most assertion libraries are just syntactic sugar over the top of some conditional checks and they throw some exceptions, right? So you can bring your own assertion library to any test framework you're using, but the truth is in 2022, all of them are fine, right? And people will really spend lots of time handling ranging opinions about what they think is the best assertion library. They're all the same, don't worry about it. Now, you probably, you know, people seem to think the state of, of testing is basically this thing here. It's a very, very common pyramid diagram. Um, but the reality is, Unit tests are just part of like a really incredibly broad set of different testing techniques that you can use. You know, we have unit tests, we have integration tests, acceptance tests, end-to-end -end tests, smoke tests, consumer-driven contracts, toxicity tests. There's, there's so many of these things. Oh, and also BDD, acceptance test-driven development, lots and lots of jargon, right? And the truth is that different kinds of tests in these different styles are, uh, are there to help you at different points in your development workflow. Right? The whole reason we have different styles is to get us through different problems. So, for instance, at, you know, at build time, we have um, problems like your code breaks, or basic integration between components doesn't work, or you know, other nasty code crap. Now, the solutions there are unit tests and coverage, even though coverage isn't correctness, and integration tests, which are kind of cross-component testing, and we'll talk more about that in a bit. Now, the commonalities of these cat category of tests is that all of your dependencies are mocked and everything runs in memory. Subsequently, at deploy time, you have different needs, so you need different kinds of testing. The problems are often environmental. They're related to downstream system failures, and they're slower to diagnose and debug. So the solutions to those kinds of, of problems are more end-to-end -end tests without mocking, smoke tests over your production systems. And you know, subsequently, at any kind of system integration point, we have a whole different category of problems. So we have you know, honorable mentions like continuous tests running against partner systems, consumer-driven contract tests, toxicity and quality gate tests that check that you haven't introduced poor code into your system. And all this stuff really is just there to help you fail faster. Now, while that's all a wonderful diverse list of, of tests that help you at various points, we need to kind of crawl before we run here. Um, so I want to take you through some practical examples specifically in JavaScript to start off. Now, it's probably worth highlighting that while I'd love to be brave and do a live demo here, 
Um, I don't ever trust NPM and conference Wi-Fi at the same time. They're the two things that hate each other the most. So many people will interact with code bases from some point after the application has been created. And because of that, it's entirely possible that you've written tests before in your career but have no idea how they actually work or are hooked together or run. And a lot of the JavaScript ecosystem is full of very, very complicated tools and build pipelines. So instead, we're going to go through the basic most example of how you can write tests from nothing, from an empty directory. So like with everything, there are always a few wrinkles to navigate, but <laughs> wow, lights. Um, but I'm going to presume we already have a modern version of Node installed. And you know, really, you just need three packages to write tests in JavaScript. You need Jest, you need the Jest CLI, and you need a wonderfully named Babel Preset Env. Now, Jest is the actual test framework that we've spoken about before. Um, Jest CLI is the test runner. Though I think they're starting to deprecate that and merge that into the core library now. And Babel Preset Env is a, let's see if we can get this right, it's a plugin for Babel which Jest uses implicitly that allows you to write JavaScript code that targets the current version of JavaScript in your environment. The JavaScript ecosystem. Um, we need to use Babel to be able to use modules in our code along with other modern language features is the, the real simple version. Now once we've done an NPM init, You'll be presented with an empty directory with a package.json file in it. And what we're going to do here is we're going to tweak our package.json so that our tests work out of the box. Now, first, we need to enable ES6 modules. So we're going to flip the type of the project to be a module. And everyone should be doing this in 2022. Like ES6 modules should destroy Webpack. Please, I beg of you, just use them. Now, by setting that type property, the node runtime allows you to use import and export syntax. Um, there are other ways to achieve this. You can rename your files like MJS, but a package module is the easiest way. Now, next, we're going to update our scripts configuration to call Jest. This just means that when you type npm run Jest, it'll on our command line it'll invoke Jest. Now, you could install Jest globally, but don't do that. Bad idea. Global dependency is bad. And finally, we're going to add some Babel configuration to tell the version of Babel supported by Jest to target the current Node version. Now, this configuration looks completely arcane at first, but I promise you, it's better than try to use how, learn how to use Webpack. Just, just do this instead and forget about it. So what we're saying here is configure Jest's implicitly called version of Babel to apply the preset for our current version of Node. It's probably worth noting that if you're using TypeScript, you should use TypeScript. Uh, that you'll probably end up using something like TS Jest instead that kind of takes this whole process and makes it irrelevant. Um, but right now we need it for ES6 plus compatibility. Now, once we've done all that, it seems like a lot, we can take a look at a pretty basic Jest test here. Now, firstly, I want to note that we've called it index.spec.js. Now, Jest by default scans for things called .spec.js. And it looks for them side by side with your code. Now, you can change these conventions to be .test or whatever, but there's no point in us doing that here. So when we're looking at a very, very basic Jest test, let's describe what we have. We have a file that exports a single function here on the right. And then on the left, there's a test file illustrating Jest's standard testing conventions. We have an import for our code at the top and a describe block with an embedded closure for our tests and an it block inside each of our tests. Now, the it block is the test itself, and the name of the test is in the brackets in between. Now, our names should always follow very, very simple conventions, which are very simple. What happened, under what circumstances, and what you expect the output to be. That's really the only good way to name tests, and people have tried lots of other names, but that's the one that always sticks. Now. Again, it's worth noting that we're using native import and export keywords here, which is what we get from the ES6 modules. And it works pretty well, especially if you've been trapped in like the compatibility hell of like AMD and CommonJS before. And if you've never used them before, these, these modules replace all the previous node calls to require you might have seen in your code. Now, if you've not done much JavaScript in a long time, and I know this is kind of a mixed technology conference, I'm happy to report that classes work now. Very controversial, classes in JavaScript. Um, but you can use them in exactly the same way you do any other code. And you'll hear a thousand people blog about like, oh, well, they're not real classes because JavaScript's just prototypical inheritor. Just shut up. Use language features for what they're designed for to organize your code base in a way that's comprehensive. 
syntactic sugar is there for a reason. Uh, and it works. Right, that's it. You two can now do TDD and JavaScript. You can all leave, talk over it. We're done that. I'm joking. So this is about as close to an X Unix framework as any compatible language gets. And if you like, if you like, you configure an npm watch task to run those tests every time you type in a test file. So that's a, a very, very common way that people will do things like this in JavaScript. Now, if that's unit testing, what on earth is TDD? Hands up anyone that's done TDD and be honest. Cool, great. So test-driven development is a software development process that re relies on the repetition of a very short cycle. Requirements are turned into specific test cases, and then the software is improved incrementally, step by step, as opposed to traditional software development where you just go and type the codes, where you read something and you type the codes. Right, so this, this book was published in 2003, and, and, and this, is, this is Kent Beck. It's a really nice headshot. I want a headshot that good. Now, Kent Beck, in his own words, is not a great programmer, just a good programmer with great habits. And I always thought that was a really wonderful sentiment because everyone can relate to it. Now, Kent Beck's like the one good old white man. You know how like all the computer science is old white men are now really problematic and really terrible? Kent Beck's still great. Like, we, can, we, can, we love Kent Beck. So TDD was part of the broader XP extreme programming movement of the late 90s. And Test First was pro, uh, promoted as a concept from about 1999 onwards. Um, and the interesting thing is Kent Beck always cries rediscovery. So as he describes it, I have to read this. The original description of TDD was in an ancient book about programming. It said you take the input tape, manually type the output tape, which dates it. Uh, then, then you run the program until the actual output tape matches the input tape, the expected output tape. After I'd written the first X unit framework in Smalltalk, I remembered reading this and tried it out. That was the origin of TDD for me. So when describing TDD to older programmers, I often hear people say, well, of course, how else could you possibly program? And you know, it's very much a, a discipline that came from a time with constrained physical limitations of early computing, but the pattern still holds. So while unit tests are all about testing the units of code, what they're not is a, a workflow. They're not a process or a methodology. They're just a, a programming tool. So unit tests verifying the correctness of your implementation, that's, that's their entire job. Now, test-driven development is all about building new pieces of functionality and behavior and verifying that. It's a working practice. It's an approach. The tests you produce are just kind of a side effect. Now, that's why advocates of TDD, including myself, would call it test-driven design, because you're really you're feeling out the design of your system. So the, the, the raw TDD methodology is always often used, used, described using the term red-green refactor. So it's this cyclical process. So in the red phase, your challenge is just to get a failing test as quickly as possible. Write something that's broken. Red can be as valid in a, in a typed language as a non-compiling code. Now, then the challenge is to do the simplest thing that can possibly work to make your test go green. Now, that's probably pasting in some dubious code from Stack Overflow or using Copilot today, honestly. You hack some ugly stuff in, it doesn't matter, just hard code it, who gives a crap? And the people that get TDD wrong stop there, because then they've just got a load of crap that they've hacked in. Now, the final part is the iterative loop. You refactor your code until you make it good enough. Now, this is the most important part of a TDD workflow, because it's where you shift stuff around. It, you literally change the factoring and not the behavior supported by your hopefully still green tests. Now, Ken Beck has this great passage in his book where he says, the different phases have different purposes. They call for a different style, a different solution, and a different aesthetic viewpoint. The first three phases need to go quickly so we can get to a known good state with new functionality. And just for that moment, we can commit any number of sins because speed trumps design. So to the developer of, of software, the argument for any kind of code-based testing is simple. Is this faster than me pressing run? And in my opinion, it's always faster to write a test. OK, so we've done, done the history lesson, and we've done the origins of TDD and the difference between unit testing. Let's get to the good stuff. Let's, you know, the thing about those TDD workflows, they mean you end up running your code a lot, like a lot, a lot, like multiple times a minute. Like you're, you're where are your, your shortcuts. And you know, in JavaScript, the standard solution to this is just you write a watch task. Now, there is a better way. 
and continuous test runners are the better way. And what continuous test runners do is they execute all impacted code on every key press. Now, they're just awesome, right? You see the little the, the gutter colors? That tells you whether you've got a covering test running here. Now, the first time I used a continuous test runner, I did not understand the value of the thing. I didn't know what all the fuss was about. But by the end of the second day, I bought my own copy. So this is a tool called Wallaby.js, and it's amazing, and it's like the best thing in JavaScript. Um, I resist the urge to climb on my soapbox and say you should pay for tools, but it's a paid-for tool. Support your peers. Um, costs about 100 quid a year. Um, it's great. Buy it. Nag your manager. Make them buy more copies. Now, running with Wallaby, you no longer have to do the NPM run job because if you're using VS Code, and you probably are, you just you see the nice little green lights. It's amazing. They don't pay me for promoting it, but they probably should. Um, so you can see here, if I change my invoke function to return false, you see the red light immediately, and, and it's literally like milliseconds immediately. Super, super responsive. So now we understand what a test is and how to run them and how we can build software simply in jest. I want to talk a little bit about intentionality and software. So I suppose we're, we're going to have to address the elephant in the room, and I apologize if you're at my talk at the user group. Um, burn your copy of clean code. Burn it. Burn it. Rubbish. Rubbish book. Clean, clean code is an extremely dogmatic book, and its presence in the industry has reduced discussions about quality to rote discussions about naming variables. It's reduced conversations about architectural style in the same way that adherence to the solid principles has. Its shadow is long, it's disruptive, and it's thoughtless. And it means we don't have to talk about that guy. Right. So, you know, heresy, I hear you shout heresy. How could you possibly say that about one of the most influential? It's just it's a bad book. I read it again last year. There was a point in my career where I, too, thought that naming things was what design was. But actually, in the last five or so years, I've come to value intentionality above any kind of sense of syntactic clean cleanliness. And when I say intentionality, what I mean is every single character matters. It matters. It's the work. So the most valuable thing I learned about software was to reason about it like a body of literature. It has text, it has subtext, it has authorial intent. Software is the means of communicating intent from developer to developer. And sometimes, you know, we get it more right than, than others, but in writing our code and especially in writing our tests, I want you to approach the, in, the intent of your code as if it's the most important thing. The white space matters, the rhythm of your code matters, naming matters, form matters, and function matters. And when we're talking about writing tests that survive, that don't suck, legible, thoughtful tests are the things that survive. So we have a few guiding principles here. You know, good tests test the what and not the how. They're not implementation specific and they don't require huge amounts of state to understand. They're, they test single things, be that concepts, outputs, or functions. And they need to be as good, mostly better, than the code that they're testing. So I want to take you through a few organizational patterns and tests that you may or may not have heard of. So this is the AA pattern, AAA pattern. I love it because it sounds like screaming. Um, so tests should follow this kind of general rule, arrange, act, assert. It's easier to understand the intent of the code when you use paragraphs like you would in written language. You'll hopefully see this pattern everywhere, but you might not know the name for it. Now, while it's tempting to call out that pattern with kind of comments, don't do that. It's ugly. It's an organizational pattern. Don't ruin your code with comments like that. So where possible, we should also use the relatively, like, relatively standard names for things, like system under test is a very common convention. So you might see that SUT, SUT, used to describe the thing you're testing. Now, this is most relevant where you're, you know, in situations where you're testing classes or entire components. Uh, where you have lots of dependencies flying around and you want to know what the thing that you're actually interacting with is the real thing that you, you're trying to test. We, we call it the unit of isolation. Um, we're also, I mentioned before, using a standard pattern for tests. You know, formatting aside, the test name should tell you what you're invoking under what condition and what your expectations of the code are. Now, I borrowed this spec file from an MIT licensed major open source project which, from the internet, which I shall not name. Um, it's certainly not the worst test file I've ever seen, but it's, it's pretty ugly. Don't like it. Um, what, what we're going to do is we're going to go through some techniques that we can take this thing and bring it to a place of intentional clarity. So firstly, the most obvious rule, please use white space. 
just like you wouldn't write an English essay without paragraphs, use paragraphs in your code, they matter. You know, this example is one of a handful of problems that a total lack of white space in this test file here slows down your comprehension. The file on the left here has no significant white space at all. So the different phases of the test functions are completely obscured. Now, introducing some new lines, as shown on the right, makes the tests easier to read. It's simple. People fall into this horrible trap often of, of making their tests terse, and they mistake uniformity, the way that something looks, when it looks neat or similar, for expressiveness. And actually, expressiveness and uniformity are like on two opposite ends of the scale. So it's far better for distinct parts of your test files and functions, or any code at all, to look different when they do different things. So no magic numbers or magic anythings. We, love them. we hate magic here. We'll go with that. Um, magic numbers in test code are even more evil than magic numbers in regular code, because when you use a magic number in a test, you give it meaning. You give it importance. So here, minus one is a magic number that needs a name. I don't know what that means. I need the author of the test to tell me why it is that number. I need to know if I should worry about it or not. Now, even though I'm describing this as a magic number, magic strings and other test data fall into the same category. One of the common tricks you can use to make your test data stand out is to literally call it out in the test. So if you're passing a string that you don't care about the value of, make the value of the string some valid data or something I don't care about. Because then when the, the, the reader comes to comprehend your test, it, it makes sense. They understand to ignore the data. Now, in this specific example, we could have also relied on the test name to provide this context of an invalid week, which is what minus one really meant. Now, it's not quite as legible, uh, you know, because minus one still feels a little bit magic. But in a test so small, like it's tolerable. It doesn't compromise the integrity of that code. You know, remember, you're optimizing for the reader. And everything when you read depends on context. We should also avoid unnecessary data, like irrelevant test data. So here, all of those headers, they fool you into thinking they're important. They make you think that your code depends on them. Now, it's impossible to understand what's going on in that test, because you're basically sucker punched by a wall of noise. You can't comprehend that. Um, sucker punched by a wall of noise is the name of my grindcore album coming out next year. Um, but you need to make sure that when you're specifying test data, you need to include only the data that is impacting the test in all, all times. Remove the noise, and you increase the legibility. You see here, you can see the exact condition that triggers the behavior we're testing for. And it's because our actual implementation only checks the request method property. We get to slim down all the rest of that test code to only um, trigger the specific block of code that is required. In this case, we're checking that the request.method um, property is, is, is set to get. Now, as much as possible, we should always avoid repetition in test data. Now, because again, visual noise causes the reader to start skimming. And skimming, when you're reading code, is the worst thing you can do because you're not interpreting it, right? Here, we have code that requires a whole lot of test data to execute. And because we're testing two different scenarios, we need two different tests. So by extracting that request construction, we can more clearly see the intent of our code rather than just be blindsided by the noise everywhere. So our valid request with function here takes two arguments that will create test data in the correct form um, for both of our tests. And yes, before anyone yells, I know that's technically drying out our test code. But um, you should always strive to remove any kind of statements that are inconsequential from the tests that your, your maintainers read. Now, it's also important that you keep tests up to date, especially in JavaScript. Now, the thing about JavaScript is the language changes frequently and is increasingly adding shorthands to things that were a lot uglier in the past. Now, you know, here we're destructuring the result of the HTTP get function and extracting the body. So this includes using, um, instead of, um, in, it, we use includes instead of index of, for example. And it seems like a nothing. But if you don't keep your tests up to date and move with your language, then actually what you end up with is a, a whole horrible spread of language features across your test as your software lives. Now, these subtle improvements to language may seem invisible at a skim read, but when you're a developer trying to work with something that has broken, tight, uh, tight legible, production-grade tests, it makes your life a lot easier to find the errors in the code, right? Keep it up to date. Stop people asking questions. Um, we should also use test data builders. 
So if you find yourself extracting similar categories of test code repeatedly, there's a pattern called a test data builder where you kind of build a domain specific language up for your software of all the common use cases like valid customers and invalid records and all this stuff that often ends up littered throughout a test code base. Do it once, do it in one place and have some well constructed data builders that that make your code legible again. You get, you, again, you're, what you're really doing is you're finding the language of your tests and the way that you can communicate with your team. So here, you can use the test data builder pattern to construct known qualities of quantities of test data that can be shared amongst tests. So actually, you slim all your tests down by extracting that knowledge. Just think of it as like domain-driven design, but for tests. Um, we should also look to isolate systems we don't control. So this is the bit that people often run into in testing most frequently. You know, it's trivial to accidentally add dependencies to an out-of-process system that you don't control, especially in the world of microservices and especially in the world of APIs. Um, it's important to isolate yourself from storage downstream systems and, and networking things because, honestly, the first time you try and pull your code base when you're on a plane and it doesn't work, it's very, very depressing. Now, you can use Jest's built-in mock functions to mock the behavior of other modules in JavaScript. Now, Jest's documentation around mocking is, is absolutely awful, but this is basically the easiest way to use it. Um, it's important to highlight that you have to call Jest mock in JavaScript at the very, very top of your files before you import anything, because it hooks into the import system so it can substitute out fakes. Um, you should be careful, though, when introducing mocks into your test code. Now, mocking being the act of swapping out one dependency for the other is very common in tests that use kind of um, you know, extensive third-party systems and become brittle to change because it's very, very easy to write tests that just exercise mocks and don't really exercise the real behavior of your systems. So you should use mocks, but like, be really, really careful about them. And I, I definitely would recommend against inspecting on, on mock states and things because those, those things can break very, very trivially and you don't necessarily know that your mocks are going to track the exact behavior of the systems you're isolating. Um, what I would use them for, though, is things like file system, APIs, stuff that's pretty static and doesn't change so often. We also should focus on asserting single concepts in tests. Now, this is often misinterpreted to mean one assertion statement per test which is absolutely wild. Um, the idea is all the things that, um, you know, in this example, we're taking a library that can reset its configuration. Now, it clearly contains two kinds of configuration, some kind of global site context and like a regular config object. So the ability to, to reset both of those values are clearly individual features of the code, and they should be split out into two separate tests, even if it looks more copy and paste and introduces um, duplication. And you know, that's because you want your features to fail and succeed independently. Now, let's revisit that example file at the beginning to see if we can apply some of our techniques. Now, before we did anything to the file, it looked a little bit like this. I've split it over two, two screens here. Now, after some gentle rework, we end up with something that looks like this. Now, what did we actually do here? Well, what we did is we, we worked on reducing the cognitive load so that every single thing you see in that test matters. We introduced white space to help the reader. We split out some concepts into their own tests. But most importantly, the thing that was most broken about this file is it was repeatedly testing the basic configuration, the basic state. So what we did is we just wrote one test asserting that, which had failed distinctly, and split out all of the other tests. What it does is it, it makes this thing really easy to reason about. Now, the tests were originally relying on distinct tests, and, and by you know, reducing those things, you know, I know it doesn't seem like much, but I hope you'll agree the difference is massive between those two files. Like it, it just, it's day and night away, and that's because you, I treated it like every line of code mattered. Every single character was important, and that's what I mean when I talk about intentionality. Now, so far we've spoken about the small minutiae of increasing the legibility of our tests, but I want to talk to you about my two big rules. Now, Testing the what and not the how, and testing capabilities of code and not your test data. I believe these are the two things that together impact the quality of tests in every code base. Now, testing the exact implementation of a dependency is one of the most common pitfalls in testing. You should be testing the outcomes of your system under test, not how they reach those conclusions. 
the, you know, the, the, the litmus test is these, these kinds of tests are brittle to change. You can throw out your entire implementation and your test should still pass. Right? That's, you know, that's the, the quality of a good test. And in this example here, we're asserting ex explicitly on this kind of weather API and making sure that it's called by a URL. But it's a leaky abstraction. And it's literally testing how we are reaching the conclusion, not the outcome. It's secretly, actually, accidentally testing that that API key doesn't change. And that's kind of a bug in our tests. So if we change our weather API, this test will still pass. Um, perhaps with a single change to our one like helper function at the bottom that says weather API returns, it's important to note that we are still exposed to some details of the test here. It's not completely resilient to change, but we only need to change one thing to fix our test if the downstream system changes. You know, it's okay if you need to test one thing. Changes are okay, that's fine, it's code, but small centralized changes are better. Now you could go further and extract this logic into its own specific like adapter class, but the truth is for a system this small, keep it simple, it's fine. And obviously don't hard code API keys, is stupid. Now the best example I can give around testing capabilities over data is something called the diamond cutter. Now, the idea is simple. Given a character, draw an ASCII art diamond with that character on the middle line. I use this as a recruitment test, actually. It's an, and it's especially tricky as a TDD cater because the data is a well-known category of data. It's the alphabet. The alphabet doesn't change. So the diamond cater isn't too difficult. There's like 40 ways of doing it. Here's a solution I'm using for it. You don't need to read it. It's very, very simple. We're, we're generating up the top half, and then we're flipping it and returning it. Fine, whatever. Now, this is a, these are the, uh, an example of the kind of tests I often get uh, sent when I ask them to, to do the diamond cutter. They're these ocean boiling tests that are only testing the test data. And you know, they're, they're very in, hard to incrementally TDD because you, kind of, you write a test for A and then you write a test for B and you realize the test for B is the whole solution. Right? Um, it's a perfect example of how people think about the testing data rather than capabilities because it's basically this. Right, it's a draw the whole fucking owl problem. Right, the, the second thing is the whole thing. Now, a better solution, a better way of driving this stuff out by TDD is focusing on the capabilities. So here you can see we have an edge case, A, and another category of data, which is everything that isn't A. And what we're doing is we're building up test by test, inspecting the quality of code that constructs a diamond. We're testing what the code actually does, not how it does it. So this means that in you know, if any of our specific capabilities get broken, we'll know which bits we need to change. Now, learning to test the what and not the how is the most useful lesson in all of testing. So you can see here that you know we're, we're testing. You know, there's, there's more than one um, letter given the the input. The first line is always a. That the diamond is always an equal width. It's always an equal height. Those are the characteristics. Um, so what we've done is we've arrived at this weird inflection point where we have so many different types of tests. But actually, it makes things often more confusing and not less. People get stuck in the cycle of conversations of wondering, what's a unit test? What's an integration test? What's an acceptance test? Oh, does this count as end-to-end -end testing? And I think it's all because of integration tests. I think we've broken integration tests. So there's this traditional definition of integration tests where an integration test is a test covering the interactions between one or more class or functions. Now, there are also people that think integration tests are tests that test everything, including the database. There are also people that think integration tests are tests that test everything excluding the database. And you're just like, oh, God, that's, that's opposites. Right? The, the, the integration tests are like the literally of the English language, where literally can now technically mean figuratively as well, because it's used ironically so often that the dictionary changed the definition of the word literally. Um, so integration tests have to die. We have to lose the name. Um, we can't do it anymore. So, but at the same time as integration tests having lost their identity, really, this, the, this category of tests that test lots and lots of things um, combined is actually really powerful. You know, as our computers have increased in power and our tools have got better, it's perfectly plausible and even good to run your entire application in memory and assert on its output state, right? And you see this rising trend, especially in JavaScript ecosystems, and it kind of started in a place where people were doing rubbishy browser-based outside-in tests. But actually, being able to test the complete composition of your application in memory is good, right? It's really cool. So even more interestingly, though, these tools are now fast. And if you combine fast tooling 
with continuous test runners and in-memory applications. You can do these kind of full-stack in-memory integration component tests. People really struggle with naming these things. But you can just outside in test what you want your application to be. And especially as microservices become more popular, the scope of an application gets smaller as well. So this is just really viable. So the truth is it's a little bit of a testing style that's just all the other testing styles. Um, I like the way um, Ian Cooper describes this. It's just developer tests. Cool, I get it. That's what they are. So while we struggle to name it, what they really are are the tests that execute fast, they execute in memory, they're like unit tests, they're not brittle, they're outside in, and they test business level functionality. And the, the twist is they're generally authored in this great high to low level TDD workflow. And you know, just because the names don't feel right, it, it doesn't matter. They're just the tests for our program. Now the most important thing about this, this pattern is the workflow, right? So when writing traditional tests, it was common to start writing tests around a class and then like an adapter or a repository, and then you go out and you kind of write the same tests in the middle, and then the same tests get written again, and people get really confused about the duplication of effort. And actually, what you end up with is a bunch of tests that like walking through treacle, because there's too much in them, and they're too confusing, and it's slow and laborious. And it's a very, I don't know, end-tier layered approach to testing. So there's probably a better way, right? Like. There's, there's got to be a way, better way. And I think what we've ended up at a place of is actually with these outside-in tests, you don't need to have those kind of tightly bound designs where you wrap and encapsulate and you wrap and encapsulate. Um, we're, we're liberated from that onion architecture approach to testing by these outside-in tests, and they're just better. Now, in the mid-2000s, when lots of thinking and writing was happening around this topic, there was something called the London Extreme Tuesday Club, and they popularized the idea of what later became known as Mockus testing. Now, Mockus testing was exactly that onion peel approach of you have components and you mock it and you test it again and you mock it and you test it again. And you know what? They promoted this as an alternative to traditional TDD, which was always outside in and always focused on the output of functions. Now, I think this new wave of developer tests completely replaces that style and highlights what a negative effect those kind of treacly, immovable tests have on software, because ultimately those tests are brittle. London School, Mockus style testing doesn't survive. And that's my piece. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? Thumbs up, thumbs down. Please, question. You're going to have to shout louder. Contract testing is great, but everyone always screws it up. So contract testing is when you desperately try and isolate your teams from one another by saying you will write down a definition of a thing first and you'll get it right. But the truth about software is there's this really, really great um, story about making the, first, uh, the second Star Wars film. And George Lucas is a notoriously terrible scriptwriter. Right, and he has script doctors that made Star Wars good. And there's this Harrison Ford had done 50 takes of some scene, and he storms off set and he yells at him, George, you can write this shit, but you can't say it. And contract testing so often is that, right? People write down what they think their software is going to look like, and no software survives like first impact with another system or another team or another user. So I feel like contract testing has its heart in the right place but then often ends up with a lot of churn and rework. Honestly, if you think contract testing is good, just pair your two teams together because they clearly have coupled dependencies. Now, I think that differs a little bit if you're using kind of external services that change at a different cadence. And um, what I would normally choose then if I was using, say, a third party that I can control is a consumer-driven contract test. And the difference between the two approaches of this contract testing says, here's the shape. Make sure you give me the shape. Consumer-driven contract tests say, well, I actually don't care what your API returns, but I'm using the name property. So if I write a test that says, whatever I get back, as long as it has a name, I'm good. Actually, what it means is you can evolve your systems because the teams can change and mature their APIs, and they know that their consumer-driven contracts, their expectations of that API, are always met until they are broken. So I've used that technique a lot when I'm working with like unpredictable third parties, and I assure you, you've all worked with unpredictable third parties, right? 
Anyone else? Any more? Was that helpful? Was that good? Smiles? Smiles? Awesome. Perfect. Thank you so much, everybody.